two Greco and probably the 14, uh, which was uh, 14 was Richland. They were very impressive looking youngsters. So I marked them one for 12, 2 and 14 for race 2 on the program. Roy Higgins with his thoughts on race 2, the Anderson Consulting Stakes. They're up behind the gates. You just saw Greg Hall leaning on the rail there talking to Graham Salisbury. And Graham Salisbury is riding Sub-Zero, the horse on which Greg won the Melbourne Cup four years ago. Well, Darren Gauchy is the rider for Le Mans here, the one that we fancy. And let's see what he had to say about the second event. To game. Well, he, he, you know, he won well his first start. He got a fair way back uh, in the race. His main concern today, more so, is uh, which division trying to be faster, the inside or the outside. And uh, the outside division has been faster of the track in recent months. So uh, he might have the job ahead of him from Barrier 5, but luck prevailing, he'll run very well. Thanks. So Darren Gauchy hopeful there, and it'll be interesting to see if he does come to the outside. Dan and Gary, I know you've had a look at the track. I had a look at it yesterday afternoon out here, and I had no doubt that the outside was quicker. Yeah, definitely, Peter. It's, uh, it's uh, definitely faster. If you can get to, say, three off the fence, it's definitely. But, uh, by gee, it's an open race. It'll be interesting if number 17 can get up. It's trained by Les Coles, who won the Cup in 1962 on Even Stevens. I like the look of Richland, one of uh, Tommy Hughes's. And number one, Le Mans, uh, trained by John Hawks. He's turned it out beautiful, that horse. This is the race that Gold Ace won some two years ago when he was first up. But, of course, it's the, the Hawks horses now that seem to be dominating the early two-year-old races. Le Mans has been easy on track, but I think that's the reason of being drawn the inside of the track here, Gary. Yeah, definitely, Dan. And it's just uh, going to be interesting to see where these boys go on these horses. It's a bit harder to get a two-year-old to come to the outside because they're used to going to the inside rail and following the rail. Just interested if they can get them to come to the outside if they want to. The ones that are drawn out wide, that won't be any problem, but the ones that are drawn in, they're, they're inclined to want to lay in with you a little bit. And it's a great advantage if you can draw the rail. In this race, once they get to about the halfway mark, we'll be able to show you an overhead shot and you'll be able to determine yourself which side of the track is in front and by how far so it might be a real good indication as to which side of the track your horse might be on saturday the outside was decisively faster i think it was a little bit more even today but you would still favor the outside perhaps by uh, by two lengths i would say gary but it's not as decisive i think as saturday no definitely not in the uh, with the sun coming out now the cloud cover is gradually moving away this track is drying out and uh, it'll get faster and faster as the day goes on there's no north wind like there was on Saturday either. No, it seems as suddenly today it's turned right around the exact opposite. They say the outside section horses are favoured down the straight six when there is a, a north wind blowing like it was on Saturday. Yeah, definitely. There's a great shot of all this crowd. It's, it's incredible, the crowd here already. And the last couple coming up to the line. Knights off for ready. And Grego goes up for Stephen King. Won the Melbourne Cup on Let's Alope in 1991, Stephen King. The youngsters are ready now. The light is on. Away they go. Now away fairly well. Grey go towards the outside with Knights Opera. Most of them are going to come down the grandstand side of the track. And there's a couple that will come flat up against the inside rail. Rancho Red was one of them, and so too was Lear and also Comet King. Whereas down the grandstand side of the track, it's Grego showing the lead. Likely was up there in the early part, and they were followed by China Express sharing the lead with those from Knight's Opera. Just in behind them was Zamorano, followed by Richland into about fifth position. Behind it was Gurok. Air Boom was under the whip. Le Mans has got about five lengths to make up as they run onto the course proper. They've got about 400 metres to go, and the flat side is certainly well in this as well. Rancho Red in front from Lear and then came Comet King inside the last 300 metres down the grandstand side of the track. China Express in front of Grego. Then Rich Land. Le Mans is only struggling. China Express is in front. Oh, it's got it well won. China Express. It's drawing right away. Grego into second with Rich Land but China Express bolts in. China Express first. Nearly a dead hit. Grego. Rich Land for the Miners. Then Gurok and Le Mans. Then the inside horses Rancho Red and Lear. They're only beaten about five lengths and the winner did bolt in Knights Opera next in followed by likely Sir Talak and Grego just pulling up quickly after the post with Zamorano Comet King then Great Raids Air Boom and Drew Gaga back towards the tail well Dan you can just see that difference in that outside but gee that horse won well China Express ridden by Brett Pell trained by John Ma you know he really uh, puts the work in on his horses gets them going right and when he brings them to town first up, you know they must be something special because he generally starts them off in the country. 
photo for the minor placings. There was a bob and go for second. Two horses down the outside of the track. But the winner is number four, China Express, a Green Line Express Colt, and out of Sharp in Slippery. Trained by Johnny Ma, written by Brett Preble. It seemed to have them covered a fair way out. Oh, it certainly did. I went to the line, and yeah, I think it's pretty smart. Le Mans, it was interesting at the start. Darren Gauchy obviously wanted to come to the outside, but the horse outside of him wanted to go to the inside, and I see he got tangled up a little bit there. So if you have back Le Mans, well, just sort of forget about it, because he did try to get him to the outside. You can actually see him here. He's racing about five lengths off them in the cerise colours on the inside there. But on that part of the track, it's not quite as good as where the winner is. You have to get out today. You have to be on that outside rail there. Those inside horses, Gary, I don't think there was that big a difference. The winner bolted in. And if you look at from the outside to the inside, don't forget Rancho Red that led the inside brigade was the rank outsider of the field. So if you look at where his position was in the race, I don't think there was that big a difference. I said before, probably two lengths, and I'd stand by that now. Yeah, that'll be about right now. It'll dry out a bit more, the inside, because as they race, this is a great shot here from this uh, balloon above us here. It's just incredible. And there's the winner going across the line there. You'll notice how they move in a little bit as they come down. 58.7 was the time, comparable to the track record of 55.5, but they are, these are two-year-olds. Must be difficult for the two-year-olds when they've got to change course coming down the middle of the track, and a lot of them didn't have a rail to guide them, which is very important for youngsters. Well, well it's very hard, and that's why it's such a great run of the horse uh, Darren Gauchy Road, because, as I say, he definitely got uh, at the start after about 100 yards. It's obvious Darren wanted to go to the outside. And Dead heat for second, Gary. So it's a dead heat between two Grego and 14 Rich Land. So four and a dead heat for second between numbers two and 14. So I must have been eating the carrots lately. So at least we're in good shape as far as that's concerned. Gurok ran fourth, a nice run. And Le Mans, I wouldn't sack him on that. I thought that was oh, a no. good effort considering. But the winner looked very brilliant. And he's coming back to scale with jockey Brett Preble, which would be a tremendous thrill for Brett. He won the first race on, uh, on, on Derby Day, and he's won the first flat race on Cup Day. Big yeah. thrill. Yeah. Talks with uh, dual Melbourne Cup winning jockey John Lee. Yeah, Brett, you were saying you led all the way from here. It looked like the inside division was well in front of you, but uh, it's deceiving, isn't it? Yeah, it was. There was only one leading me outside early. Once I got to about probably to 500, but took over the lead, and, you know, I think he won pretty convincingly. He's a little keyed up little horse, isn't he? he yeah. just, he's fired up. He's even fired up now. I think you could get run him again. Yeah, you know, just this breed, the Green Line Express, they sort of are a little bit sort of funny when they're a bit younger. Just hopefully it gets better as he gets older. Yeah, Brett, and uh, well, he, he looked pretty tractable in the run. It's hard for a horse having his first start to come down the outside rail here at Flemington, especially with the big crowd. Yeah, my word it is. You know, he's done a pretty good job. He's, OK. Uh, thanks. Thanks very much, Brett. Thanks good luck for the rest of the carnival, mate. Sure. You got on your two great blokes there, John Letts and Brett Preble. Well, John Ma really aims his horses Melbourne Cup week. He picks and chooses the races. He's a very astute man, Peter Donegan. He is indeed, Dan, and uh, that might be a pretty smart galloper you've got there, John. Yeah, he's quite a smart horse. Out of an English winning mare, a uh, thousand metre, or five furlong winning mare, rather. Uh, nice horse, quite immature, so he might make up to be a um, pretty smart horse in the autumn. When he drew sort of in the middle of the field, I suppose that helped your confidence a bit. We walked the track and I felt the best ground uh, was about three off the inside running rail, but obviously for some unknown reason, the, uh, the, uh, either the best horse would come in the outside or it is quicker. So I said to Brett, I would imagine you'd come to the outside. How high can he fly, this horse? Well, look, he really surprised me. I, I, I expect him to run well. I didn't expect him to go and win by four or five. Um, like I say, you know, he's out of a, he's got a nice pedigree. He's very quick, and I think he's quite immature. So um, he'll probably go to the paddock after that win, and I hope he can mature, you know, develop and um, uh, mature up and uh, naturally improve. A win on Derby Day, a win on Cup Day. It's nice. Oh, I hope we've just started. Thanks very much. Well Thanks. done. Thanks. John Mather, winning trainer with this very smart two-year-old China Express. Dead heat for second between Grego number two and number 14, Richland. Smart time two for the two-year-olds. 58.7. We'll take a break. Back with the correct weight signal and all the dividends after the Anderson Consulting Stakes very shortly. Indeed, Melbourne Cup Day. We're after correct weight on the second. An extremely good win Number by China two, Express. Four, heat, Number two, four, four, Mr. Gleeson seven, will give us one, the wave. Eight, correct weight. So weight is right. And there's the scene. Just in front of the mounting yard. A lot of people here, and the day is getting nicer and nicer. 
and uh, 100,000 were after the VRC would be ecstatic with that, but David Burke told me the other day, the chairman, he'd be pretty happy with 98 as well. <laughs> and it's just a terrific day. The totes just delayed for a second. There's a dead heat between second and third. And Cup Day is shaping up. Well, now there's a fabulous shot of the crowd for you. Look at that. Uh, that's down in front of the members and a little bit of the uh, public enclosure. And everyone just having a terrific day. We're just trying to think back, you know, can you remember all of uh, Bart's nine Cup winners? Light Fingers, Galilee, Red Handed, the first three. Think Big twice. Golden Black, Hyperno, Kingston Rule. And Let's Elope. And can he make it 10 today? Wouldn't that be a crowning achievement for one of the great trainers? With Saintly. And uh, we saw, so we thought we saw Saintly at the back, but I think they had the wrong name on the store. And uh, he could just do it. We might go to the presentations first. Here's Rob Gaylor. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. The Anderson Consulting Stakes representing the VRC. This is. Uh, P.A. Chernside, but to make the presentations, the uh, managing partner of Anderson Consulting, Mr. Derek Young. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Anderson Consulting is very proud to be associated with the 1996 Spring Racing Carnival, and particularly Melbourne Cup Day. The VRC has done a magnificent job in preparing Flemington Racecourse for the Melbourne Cup and also in organising what must be one of the largest crowds we've had at a Melbourne Cup for many, many years. Even the uh, great steward in the sky above has seen fit to give us the nicest day uh, we've had for Melbourne Cup for about five years. And race goers can display their finery and hats and they look marvellous. But most of us are here for the racing and I'd like to congratulate the uh, China Express on winning Anderson Consulting Stakes. I'd also like to congratulate the trainer, John Ma, and the jockey today, Brett Preble. Most importantly, I'd like to congratulate the owners, uh, Daniel and Suzanne Ziegel, who uh, pay the trainer's bills, uh, go through the ups and downs of owning racehorses, and occasionally get a day in the sun like today. Uh, Des O'Keefe is going to accept the trophy on their behalf. All right, as those presentations are taking place, let's throw back down to Peter Donegan and Jenny Chapman. That's a pretty smart galloper, that China Express, Pete. Very smart, Tim, and I think uh, a good indicator, Jen, was the gaps in the field there. There was a long way between first and last, and that horse just went away at the end and won by more than four lengths. Well, he does look like a very nice young horse in the making, doesn't he? And just coming back to scale, he seems quite mature, too, knows what it's all about. Now, what about the third, the X-Files 1400? Is this a mystery? Um, <laughs> quite possibly. I don't think it is, though, Pete. I'm going for number three here, Vigil. I was quite impressed by her last start performance. She was just great on the line she had to work very hard she didn't have any cover three wide took over on the turn and just grabbed on the line i thought that was an excellent run i think she can improve from number five yeldon dawn whose fresh form is always best she's just that here today and number four fabulous frisco for third i thought number 14 is did you get my joke by the way the yes answer? i did Thank that's you. what i said i don't think it's a mystery well, thanks for reacting <laughs> uh number 14 is for me each way here in race three the x-files 1400 sponsored of course by network 10 and the starting time there is 12:25. Dan, you can tell us more. Most uh, certainly, Peter, for the third event. Again, another fairly open affair, as are all the races today. Amber's open up $7.320. Number three, Vigil, is favourite, $5.40. Four Fabulous Frisco, $6 into $5.70 as they update. Uh, Yelgen Dawn around and over are going to give you a great value. If they're your fancies, number seven is a scratching. Eight is top ratio in the market at $9.80. Innocent Affair, $16.80. Wild Violet, Apollo Lane, Cleopatra's Girl, all at good odds. Then down to Escada, 5.40 and $1.70 is well in the market, challenging for favouritism already. Kaylee Princess, a stable mate of the previous winner at $14. That's for Flemington race number three. Pete, on the previous, the margins were four and a half lengths via dead heat. The time, 58.7. Fourth was Gurok, number seven. Fifth in number one, Le Mans. And there is a computer breakdown off course at the TAV, and that's the reason for the delay on the totes on race two. Right, Dan, we'll bring you those tote dividends as soon as they do become available to us. Down to the betting ring now and uh, how did the bookies fare in race two tim going okay peter at the moment i think they got off uh, quite, quite light
lightly. And in fact, they've got off okay in the first two events. In the third, the X-Files, while well, they do like Vigil down here, also Amber. Any number of, there's about six or seven horses under double figure odds. The interesting one is Innocent Affair, about 15 to one on the tote. Half that with some bookmakers, the same with others. It's all over the place, but there is a quiet tip. The coat tuggers are out, Innocent Affair in the third. Thank you, Tim. Well, I can tell you that uh, when I started uh, getting acquainted with the Melbourne Cup, one of the reasons I did was uh, the voice of my next guest. And uh, I'm happy to say that Bill Collins has joined us here at Flemington. How are you, Bill? Well, thanks, Pete. How are you? I'm very well. Good. Importantly, how's the health? Oh, well, it's, it's pretty good. It's standing up pretty well. I've had a rather hectic time up to date, and uh, I'm standing up reasonably well. You've been around in everything by the Melbourne to Warrnambool bike race over the last couple of weeks. Well, that's <laughs> right. If anything, I'm overtrained, I think. <laughs> It must be great to be back at Flemington on this very special well, day for you. Yes, it is. It's a, it's a wonderful day, and, and I'm, I'm so glad that the weather has turned out so well for the VRC. They haven't had much luck with the weather, have they? But by gosh, if there's not 90,000 people here today, I'll give up. Do you remember the day 42 years ago when you uh, sat behind the binoculars for the first time and Rising yeah. Fast won the Melbourne Cup? Yeah, I, I, I was terribly lucky that there was that, that year there was a horse like Rising Fast. You know, he, apart from the weight for age races, he won the Caulfield Cup and the Mooney, the Cox Plate at Mooney Valley, and then the Melbourne Cup. You know, unbelievable. He's a, he's a much underrated horse when people look back on on the good horses, because he came out next year and he won the Caulfield Cup and he got beaten half a length and in the Melbourne Cup and there's probably an argument to say that he probably he could have, have won the Melbourne Cup he was beaten by uh, Tommy Smith's horse top a row which had no weight on its back yeah. and the stewards gave uh, Neville Selwood who rode it a couple of months holiday for not uh, or for not stopping it from drifting out in the straight and y yes that, that that was a, a race that I'll never forget and it was uh, it was just a wonderful year that year 1954 and uh, Rising Fast was such a great horse. What do you like in 1996, Bill? Well, it's very difficult, Pete, because the couple of horses that I really like, I've never ever seen them. Yeah. And, and neither has anybody else as far as racing is concerned. I do like Senator from New Zealand because he has won over two miles. I know there's an argument that uh, the New Zealand horses this year aren't possibly as good as they have been, but he, he's, he's won over the two miles, which is a lot in his favour because a lot of horses look to be going well and they turn into the straight for the finish of a Melbourne Cup and they hit a brick wall, yeah. you know. And uh, of course Oscar Schwindler or Schindler, Schindler, yeah. Schindler uh, he's another one that we've never seen race but he's going to take a lot of beating. Bill, they're blowing the protest yeah. siren because you're not in the betting ring. We're going to yeah. let you go and have a bet. On you. Can I just say thank you to you because if it wasn't for you I wouldn't be doing this job today. Good on you Pete and you're doing it well too. Good luck. Thanks very much to Bill Collins. Tim, always great to see him at the races, especially now. Absolutely, Peter, and uh, it's a credit to him that he's got around as much. I'm just looking for something, Pete, in the X-Files 1400 that has something to do with the program. Mm -hmm. uh, innocent affair, I thought, because they're all both protesting their innocence. Yeah. No? Yes, well, let's hope it's not a late scratching. No, we're just getting a late scratching uh -huh. now very quickly. Race 5, number 19, Manshapka, a late scratching, Tim. So race 5, number right. 19, Manshapka, a late scratching. And yes, we'll go with innocent affair. Why not? Or amber. There's always an amber wash over the program, too. You know that amber light they're going to... Whatever. <laughs> we can tell you, we know we haven't done the totes uh, on that race. Apparently, they've got a bit of a problem with the computer at Tab Corp. We'll bring them to you as soon as we can. I want to mention Don Bagnato, the beautiful clothes that he supplies us with every year. The best part about it is, of course, I don't have to bring a whole suit bag full of stuff down here because I'm supplied with these magnificent suits, as are all of our staff. And thank you very much to Don Bagnato. Now, fashion competition. This is something we want you to get involved in, and all you have to do is get on the phone and here's how to do it you can be a winner in our cup day fashion competition just by calling 0055 606 58 if you know the right answer to this question when did Prue Acton steal the limelight at the Melbourne Cup with her Australian outfit was it a in 1984 or B in 1979 Two winners will be chosen from callers with the correct answers and they will each receive a great prize of $1,000 in fashions from Suzanne's. So ring 0055 606 58 and you can call right up until 4 o'clock Eastern Summer Time. Winners will be announced after race 8 today.
Yes, and all the best. I think we took about 15,000 calls on Derby Day, so a lot more viewers today, I would think, so perhaps a lot more calls. So get on the phone quickly. Now, we haven't had a chance. We've been very busy, we've been, uh, to get around and see all of our co-colleagues today, but let's go and join Sandra Sully in the 10 marquee with the cast of Medivac. Tim, joining me now, two of the stars from 10's new primetime drama, drama Medivac, Genevieve Picot and Grant Bowling. Thanks for joining us today. How are you enjoying the cup so far? Oh, so far it's fantastic. I can't wait to get to the course though and actually kind of see a real horse. What about you, Grant? This is your first cup, isn't it? It's my first cup. I'm having a cracker. An absolute now, great time. Now, you're both having a good time, but on screen, you two don't actually get on, do you? Oh, well, he's a bit of a bother boy, although he comes from a very rich family, and I don't like people who pretend they're something that they're not. She's a bit of a snob. <laughs> <laughs> now, your character uh, enjoys horses, makes uh, regular visits to the carnival, doing a bit of background uh, work oh, here. This is just a fantastic opportunity for me, because I can see the real thing in action. It's fabulous. So, um, I'll be watching breeders and trainers and owners very closely today. What about tips today, Grum? As a roughie, my Kiwi gold, I think. What about you, Genevieve? Oh, grey shot is looking more and more interesting to me. All right, well, good luck today. We hope you have a wonderful day, and uh, good luck with your punting. Thank you. Thank you. Back to you, Tim. Thank you, Sandra. Wherever you're watching the Melbourne Cup from, whatever you're doing, you keep having a good time, and we'll keep supplying you with the pictures. This is the Melbourne Cup of 1996. Back very soon. Chocolates Lightship views of Flemington. Look at the crowd. You could not fit a can of Fosters between some of them down there. I tell you, everyone's in a great mood as you would be. The day has really turned out to be quite terrific. In fact, it being cool is an advantage, I think, for everybody. It makes things quite comfortable. And uh, there you go. You'll see a sight every five metres when you walk outside. Incredible hats, people dressed up, having a great time. Eskies on the lawn. Some of the kids are here too, and they probably don't know what it's all about, but Mum and Dad in years to come will be able to tell them you were at the Melbourne Cup in 1996. Well, the nine Melbourne Cup winners to his credit, starting with Light Fingers back in 1965 through to Let's Elope in 1991. It would have been very unusual for Bart Cummings last year to not have a runner in the Melbourne Cup, but he didn't. This year, that's all changed. He's got two, and don't be surprised this afternoon he steps up onto centre stage once again and takes the Melbourne Cup. Flemington, James Bartholomew Cummings, the Foster's Melbourne Cup. Three institutions, each entwined in the other. Bart Cummings as much a part of our greatest race as any man in history. Nine times he's won it. Five times he's quenelled it. 69 next week, Bart is having one of his biggest seasons in years. With Saintley's win in the Cox Plate, and three-year-olds Alpha and Dashing Eagle turning back the clock to the years when Group 1 winners were being churned out of the coming stable in three states. I just sort of grew up with the, with the horses in my blood, I suppose. Bart's father, Jim Cummings, was a Melbourne Cup winning trainer himself. And as strapper and later foreman, young Bart learned much from him. At the time, I didn't think I had. All I knew was got abused. And, but uh, <laughs> I suppose it, uh, it, was a, it was a good uh, learning learning school because uh, he was a pretty uh, fair-minded fellow but very strict and uh, yeah I suppose when you think back you've got a problem you th you figure out what dad would do that seemed to always work. No one could have predicted when Bart took out his own license in South Australia in 1954 that he would rewrite the cup record books but he has starting with light fingers in 1965 galilee and red-handed in the next two years think big twice in a row in 74 and 75 golden black in 1977 hyperno in 1979 kingston rule in 1990 and let's elope in 1991. let's elope bolts are come in wins bright leading then it's a coming spinella and the best of them Oh, I wouldn't be fair to um, discredit any one of them. They're all champions, those good horses in their own right. But um, Galilee stood out as a two-mile horse. I thought let's elope in the right conditions, was getting close to it. Uh, Light Fingers was extraordinary for a confirmation of the size of it. She must have had a heart big, big, big as herself. And um, that's about it, I suppose. As the years have passed, Bart has become more reflective. 
but it hasn't stopped him continuing the laconic one-liners for which he's famous. Like this assessment of his partner for so many years, wife Valmay. Well, she's a bit of a character and a good cook. And uh, what more do you want? But there's one thing he won't joke about. And that's his wish to win a tenth Melbourne Cup. Oh, it'll never, never lose its uh, appeal or, or its charm in the case of the Melbourne Cup because this is a nice traditional race and it's, uh, as they say, it stops Australia for three minutes. But it, uh, it's, worth, it's worth winning for sure and it's, uh, it's uh, most trainers' dream. another shot from the light ship and J.B. Cummings you know it is actually the case that he's quite embarrassed by the fame and uh, it's extraordinary when you think he is so famous but I suppose the reason he's famous Peter Donegan is because he's not just good he's very very good at what he does yes there's a certain aura about Bart Cummings Tim and we mentioned uh, his one-liners and I think my favorite gen of all the one-liners that I've ever heard from Bart was the day when an inspector went into his stables and he said Mr. Cummings you've got too many flies in here and Bart said well how many am I allowed to have yes it was a great story wasn't it <laughs> good question <laughs> now quickly the winning place totes are through on race two the others aren't through as yet the multiples but China Express paid 13 90 and four dollars the dead heaters grey go paid $1.50 and 14 Richland paid $1.90. So $13.90, $4, Grego $1.50, Richland $1.90, waiting on the Cornella and the Dublin Trifecta. Now onto the horses in the third, start off with Amber to be ridden by Mick Dipman, trained by Ron Quinton in Sydney. I'm a real fan of Amber's, I must say. I'm just a little concerned with her weight here today with 58 kilos, but um, I still think she'll go well. She's a horse that handles all sorts of surfaces. She was extremely wide last start and she really did fight on very, very well. Just the last... 100 metres did get to her. It was a, a solid effort and she's a chance. Vigil's your tip number three, Jen, uh, to be ridden by Stephen King, one train by Clary Connors at Warwick Farm and a good second at its last appearance at Randwick. A terrific performance. Another horse that was extremely wide at her last run and she really did fight on very, very strongly. I think she'll probably box seed in this race and she looks very hard to beat. Good, fabulous. Frisco looked particularly well coming into the yard number four. Damien Oliver, of course, the rider here and Jimmy Collin at Caulfield has had some bad luck lately. Yes, well, she's uh, she's resumed at Caulfield and it was a terrific effort there. Another horse that was extremely wide at her last start but went on to score on that occasion. Damien Oliver on board, he'll certainly help and she's a very good chance. You give Jorgen Dawn a chance, number five, to be ridden by Patrick Payne. Now she's a big odds, Pete, and I am giving her a chance. Uh, she won first up here last time in. She did win the Australasian Oaks in 1995. Her fresh form is very good. At those sort of odds, I think she's an excellent chance on a dry track here. Way over the $20 mark, Jorgen Dawn. Number six is around and over to be ridden by Michael Clark. She's a seven-year-old mare, but gee, she looks well. Yes, she's also a dry tracker, so she's going to appreciate this track here today. She bailed home quite well after getting back and was quite wide on the turn as well. I thought she ran on well, and uh, she's there with an, a trifecta chance in the race. Shane Dye gets on last start, Mooney Valley winner number eight, top ratio. I think this is a little harder than uh, the Mooney Valley run four top ratio. Awkwardly drawn in barrier 13 here. At best, I'd give her a place chance. The one I've gone for in the race, Jen, is number 14, Escape. Darren Beedman is the rider, Pat Highland, the trainer. The barrier's no help, barrier 16 of the 1400 metres, but she's been pretty close up at her last two behind fabulous Frisco and Eastern Princess. Sure has, and she does look to be going extremely well. She's only had the two starts here in Australia, and I do, do think you have to consider her in this with 51 and a half kilos. And Kaylee Princess, 16 to be ridden by Brett Preble. Well, she led at Caulfield, but found the opposition a bit too tough there. This is no easier for her, and I couldn't put her in. 
Sum it up, Jen, quickly on the third. Summing up, I'm going for number three, Vigil, to win from number five, Yelgan Dawn, and number four, Fabulous Frisco. Right, the map here at the 1400, they start on the far side of the track at the furthermost point away from us, and they're almost on a continual turn after settling after the start. Vigil from Jenny Chapman, Escada from myself, Vigil from Johnny Letts, and High Creek is the selection here from Richard Friedman in race number three, and that's number 15, Richard's selection. They're going up to the stalls now for the running of the X-Files 1400 sponsored by Network 10 as we survey the scene at beautiful Flemington. We'll take a break as our live and exclusive coverage of the great day, Foster's Melbourne Cup Day, continues.